WrestleMania is the biggest time of the year for us wrestling fans, right? Nothing beats the spectacle that is WrestleMania. In this two-part series, I'm going to talk to you about how in one year it can go from being one of the best shows in history to being one of the worst shows in history. That's right. In this two-part series, the highs and lows of WrestleMania, we will look at the highs of one WrestleMania that ends with the lows of another WrestleMania. In this video, we will look at the highs of WrestleMania 31. So WrestleMania 31 happened in 2015 and had a lot of things going for it, right? Uh, except for the main event was looking like people were going to sort of, I don't know, riot because of who they were planning on giving the win to. And then they shocked everyone with the ending of it that probably one of the better choices. Uh, there was two pre-show matches where the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, a match that should have only been on the WrestleMania 30 my opinion afterwards it just it was just there and then try to do a female one because they got to be all inclusive and they named it after fabulous mula and then they realized oh she was a piece of shit so we can't do that so it's just the wrestlemania women's battle well and then COVID happened and that was some one of the best things because now we don't have either of those so far i think you know, i'll just jump more about royals hold on hell on smackdown now for some reason let's cancel it we don't need it but the winner of the answer to giant memorial battle royal was the big show why he wasn't the first one, I don't know. He was literally brought in as the son of Andre the Giant in WCW. And the first winner was Cesaro. And then we had the Tag Team Championship match on a kickoff show. Fatal 4-Way match. It was Tyson Kidd and Cesaro versus Kobe Kingston and Big E of the New Day. Why well, didn't it say New Day? I don't know. Uh, the Usos and Los Matadores. I'm assuming... Tyson Kidd and Cesaro won. I didn't look it up. But the main show starts with Aloe Black performing America the Beautiful. And I will point out that um, uh, he does squeak at one early. And crown the good from Brotherhood. I think it was there or something like that. Oh no, God spread his grace on thee. I swear he goes a little bit out when he says thee, but he's fine, whatever. Let me get a bunch of promo packages. And our first match of the night is the Intercontinental Championship match. It is Dan O'Brien. Wade Barrett, who is the Intercontinental Champion, but he comes out second and doesn't have the belt because they have it hanging up there already. Uh... Dean Ambrose, Dolph Ziggler, R-Truth, who we must note is afraid of heights. Stardust and Lou Harper. And I met when this match started, I heard that theme song. I went, my heart sunk. Because it's just like, you know, he's no longer with us. So it's just, you know. And then Brian came out and I was like, you know. Could be. I mean, he did have a resurgence in his career. He's an AW now as Brian Danielson, but I don't know. It's just, once you think of this match, this match was pretty good, I'll admit. Again, I don't talk through the match as much, but this was pretty good. You had people falling out of ladders, R-Truth gingerly climbing ladders because he's afraid of heights. Stardust brings up this big old ladder that... what Michael Cole says is like a, a celestial ladder or some shit. I don't remember. This was Three and a half hours ago. This was back when WrestleMania shows were only four hours and not 15. And we got 12 hours to look forward to this time. Six on each night. Which I'm hoping that two of those are kickoff shows each night. Not that we need two hours per kickoff, but... I don't know. Anyway... 
Yeah, Daniel Bryan wins, and it is needed, and you're happy until you remember, oh, he had to give it up the next night because of his injury. And they talk about his, he had a neck injury, he thought he'd never be back, and then he came back, and then he's, I don't think he'd ever defend it. I think he gives it up the next night, doesn't he? Because of an injury? Maybe it's not the next night, but a couple weeks. I don't I don't think he ever defends it. I don't remember him doing it, but, you know, he deserves There's time for Dolph Ziggler almost grabbed it. Stardust goes for it. Barrett. Yeah. We then have Randy Orton versus Seth Rollins. This is one of the better matches on the card, man. These, these guys know what to do. The story here is that Randy Orton was part of the uh, part of the uh, Tharta, and then he got injured, and then everything was focusing on Seth Rollins, and he came back and he didn't like Seth Rollins, so he ended up turning on the Tharta and Seth Rollins, becoming a baby fast, baby, ba it's baby face, whatever, and uh, yeah, we have this match, and of course, the biggest talking point is how the match finished at one point. And you don't need to win an RKO. You think that's it? Nope. You kick, Seth kicks out. And look, especially now, a lot of WWE's matches are finisher, one, two, kick out. I don't know how to eat the finisher, one, two, kick out. It's a lot of kick outs. It's like a finisher is supposed to be an exclamation point on the match. There was a time that you were here with an RKO, you ain't getting up. But no, Randy hits RKO. On Seth Rollins, he kicks out. Likewise, Seth hits the stomp. Another move that if you got hit with it, you're not getting up. But Orton kicks out because storytelling. So, of course, we get the finish where Seth Rollins goes for a curb stomp. Reynolds reverses and hits the RKO. One, two, three. That's it. That's it. Also, RKO's j, j Security, who were... Who were, uh, you know, disrespected on W2K24 because they just like to not even looking like well, the, the guy who's supposed to be Joey Mercury looks more like Joey Mercury than the guy that's supposed to be uh, Jamie Noble. And they had models ready for him. Only thing I can think of is that when they, they made the models without knowing if there was rights and then realized, oh, they didn't sign anything. They don't have the rights to be in the game. So we have these fake discount versions of them. Yeah. This is one of the good matches. It's a good match. Yeah. Uh, Maria Menounos is talking to Daniel Bryan about winning the Intercontinental Championship. Oh no, that's later. Now we get Sting versus Triple H. Alright. Now Scotty's gonna rant. So, the one match everyone has been asking for Sting versus The Undertaker. Sting versus The Undertaker. That's what they want to see. Sting versus The Undertaker. It was heavily rumored that that's what we were going to get WrestleMania 27, but we got Triple H versus Undertaker for the second time, and then he got it again the next year in the Hell in a Cell. I always felt that Undertaker's undefeated streak was hindered by the fact that he technically defeated multiple people. Like, he, he technically defeated the same people more than once. Like, he had two matches with Kane. Three matches with Triple H. Two matches with Shawn Michaels. That kind of hinders the undefeated streak when you gotta keep facing the same people over and over again. The whole point on the undefeated streak is to show how many people you've defeated. And you're going... What was it? 21-0? and 0? How do you go? 21-0. Yeah, 21 and 0. And... Most there's some of them are repeats. It's like not really. He didn't actually defeat 21 people because he beat Triple H three times, Shawn Michaels twice, and Kane twice. It's not really, you know. Technically, he didn't actually beat 21 people. So I'm just saying, and it kind of hinders that to me anyway. That's always my opinion on it anyway. But yeah, the biggest match we ever wanted. Undertaker versus Sting. Rumored they wanted to do it. WrestleMania 27, Sting said, nah, I'm cool. So now Sting is in WWE. He signed a contract. He's here. And he's facing Triple H. And why? Well, back then we didn't know. We were just like, they're just stupid. Maybe they're going to do it next year. 
And then Seth, Seth, Seth Rollins retires Sting for like five years. And then he comes back. And you may notice that there's a bit of a ongoing thing with how WWE will... A WWE superstar will say, I have to retire because of my neck and everything. And Sting and Danny Bryan and Edge. And then they go on to another company and do pretty fucking good for themselves. I think WWE doctors don't know what the hell they're talking about. I'm just saying. But, yeah, so we have this match. Oh, yeah. By the way, it's now only now come out that the reason why we never got Sting versus The Undertaker after Sting is now retired for good. Vince McMahon didn't want it. But you know what? It's not about you, Vince. It should always be about the fans. You are not there to put out your personal agenda. You are there for the fans. If the fans aren't happy, then you're going to lose those fans. You're going to lose money. A lesson Vincent Mann has never learned, especially when we talk about WrestleMania 32, because that was the that was what is called the Vincent Mann Revenge Tour. We'll talk about that when we get there. This just yeah. And this was another Vince McMahon match because this was Vince McMahon sticking it to WCW even though WCW had been gone since 2001. So it's Sting versus Triple H and Sting comes out with the drum people. And uh, earlier in the night, we found out that WrestleMania is sponsored by Terminator Genesis. The worst Terminator movie ever made. And it's not even close. I saw it twice in theaters, but only paid once. The other one was free free but uh yeah it's, it's not good i mean i don't think any of the german movies are terrible per se but hindsight is 2020 it's not a good movie and so because it's sponsored by terminator genesis we have triple a's coming out in the terminator get up with even on sports nigger popping up with the menu judgment day is here Popping up on the Tron. He's not really there. And Triple H comes out in this get-up before his theme song, Time to Pay the Game, comes out and uh, comes out to the ring. So we have this match. And it's no disqualification, we're told. So, of course, there's going to be shenanigans. And just, you know, they go back and forth for about 10 minutes or so. I mean, not 10. This is only 18 minutes. About 5 minutes or so, I guess. This is, an 18, this is almost 19-minute match. So about five minutes, so they go back and forth. Sting trying to put him in the uh, Scorpion Deathlock. And Triple H reverses. He gets the rope, whatever. Then he finally puts him in the center of the ring. Looks like he's close to tapping. And then, uh, break it down. <laughs> Out comes Billy Gunn, Road Dog, and X-Pac to help Triple H and distract Sting. Yeah. What? When this happened, I remember we were watching in Eric's house, Eric's apartment, excuse me, over that way yonder. And I was just like, when he lived up here, it's like, what, 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 what are we doing now? And here, here's the whole thing. Okay, I gotta mention this. Eric was rooting for Triple H. He has a long history of rooting for the heels. Even though it makes no sense, you're supposed to root for the good guys. I have rooted for heels in the past because I like the wrestlers, but. You're supposed to root for the good guys and boo the bad guys. He often roots for the bad guys because in 1996, Hulk Hogan, his his biggest, like, he's a Hulk Hogan fan. And so Hulk Hogan turned bad. So that messed up his little kid brain. And, uh, you know, now he goes for the bad guys, which is fine. Messed up his little kid brain. I don't know. Maybe a lot of kids are Hogan fans. A lot of, a lot of people would have turned on Hogan. And no, you're a true Hogan fan. You don't. I, I stick with Sam Punk when he's heel. I didn't like when he turned heel in 2012 because I felt like it was unnecessary because a lot of the times when WWE does heel turns, it's because, oh, we don't have anything for them to do. Let's just turn them heel. You want proof? Zoe Stark, Ron Breaker, and uh, what's her name? The newest one, the, the Prodigy. Raquel Gun. no. The Prodigy, Roxanne Perez. Three people from NXT who did not need to turn heel. They only did because they had nothing left for him. 
And Braun Breaker's the biggest what the fuck. Because we had nothing for him. Put him on the main roster. He was ready to go to the main roster. And you said, nope, let's turn him heel and just keep him on NXT. And he was hindered in NXT because of that. And he's done nothing for a year. And then finally you put him on the main roster. After you have him win the NXT Tag Team Championships with the head scratcher. I don't know. But yes, so now DX is out there. And Triple H has the sledgehammer. And he's about to hit Sting. And then... Bam, ew, 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 ew. Three geezers from the old folks home come out. One of them playing a guitar brother. Now you realize that this is not three geezers from an old folks home that have just escaped and don't know where they are. No, it is Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Terry Boulder brother. And Hogan is in full... With the lips and the guitar. Yeah, they're they're out here now. And you're just like, this makes no sense. Because Sting's biggest enemies in WCW were the NWO. The only reason they're doing this is because NWO was WCW, DX was WWE. And that's why they're doing it. But Sting being aligned with NWO makes no sense at all. But in Vince McMahon's twisted war brain... He saw WWE versus WCW. That's all he saw with this. And it makes no sense. And so, of course, now everything aside, even Sting gets his baseball bat. And, you know, things go as they would. And just when you think Sting's got the, the advantage again, you start to realize, hey, there's a member of DX missing. Sure enough, here comes H.B. Shizzle himself, Shawn Michaels, hitting Sting with a super kick. Yes, because, yeah. And no, not as none of the member of the NWO. Eric Bischoff doesn't come running out. No. No. But if we're going for people that hate Sting helping him, Vince Russo should have come running out. <laughs> well, that case. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but, you know, Sting seems to get back into it. A little bit, and then, uh, Triple H hits the pedigree. No, he uses the sledgehammer, hits him in the face. Shawn Michaels dance around like a fucking idiot on the outside. One, two, three. This is one of two matches that I feel the wrong person won. Sting definitely should have won. And you can sit there and you can argue with me about the whole, well, it's his first match. About, oh, a uh, new person in WWE's first match, they usually got to lose. This man has been in the business for over 30 years at this point. Since the 80s. Maybe more. That kind of logic is thrown out the goddamn window. When you are a decorated veteran who has won lots of world champions. This, plain and simple, was Vince McMahon sticking it to WWE. One last time. But Sting should have won. And hindsight is twenty twenty. He lost both of his matches that he had in WWE. Now, I can give it to you, the championship match. I don't think he was ready to win the WWE championship. But he should have won this one. Because hindsight is twenty twenty. He ended up losing both of them. He didn't win one match in WWE. Well, wait, he was in a tag team match with Randy Orton on Raw. But other than that... I forgot about that. Other than that, he didn't win in a pay-per-view match, I should say. He should have won here. I'm sorry. And then what, how they end it? Everyone's shaking hands. What? Let's stick it to the... Let's uh, stick it to WCW. Uh, then uh, shake hands. Wait, you just had like a war between WWE and WCW. And no, shake hands, brother. What? Uh, whatever. Then we have Maria Menounos interviewing Dan O'Brien, where we get former Intercontinental Champions like Pat Patterson, one of my favorites, Roddy Piper, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, and Brett the Heartman. And then Farouk walks up and just goes, I, Maria goes, were you Intercontinental Champion? And he goes, damn! And walks away, and it's, what? 
Daniel Bryant was trying to say something and he never really got to say it. But, yeah. Then we have a performance that I skipped. By the way, it was during the Sting Triple H match that Peacock was being a dick. So I missed the end of the match. So I tried to rewind it. And then it stuck on the circle. So I went out, went back, and then it wouldn't let me watch it. I would press play and it would do it and pause. Now I press play again and did pause. Press play. Just it kept pausing. So I went out of the peacock, went back in, did it. Or I didn't go out of the peacock. I went back out to the main thing, went back in, did it, was still doing it. Like, screw it. I'm putting it in the Blu-ray. I have the Blu-ray, I'll put it in. I just figured it was easier than not to get up, put it in. But now I had to, especially since I'm reading from it. But now all the matches are on there, so I'm reading from it to get my matches. I want to write down, like, wait a minute, it's on the disc. I don't need to do that. Anyway, so after the performance that I skipped, we then have the uh, tag match that I don't understand. It's AJ Lee and Tage versus Nick the Bella Twins, basically. And I don't understand. So... AJ Lee had the whole invitational thing at the end of the. She raced the mul multiple divas at WrestleMania 30. And then the next night, she lost the divas title to Paige. And then Paige held it for most of 2014 until losing it to Nikki Bella. And there was some sort of. They were called the frenemies because they were sort of enemies and sort of friends because AJ was injured and came back, I think. And that's why she lost it. And what clearly should have been a triple threat match between AJ, Paige, and Nikki Bella devolved into a tag match because Vincent Mann never cared about women's wrestling. So we get a nonsensical tag match, and thus the Divas title was not on the line. And AJ Lee and Paige won. But I feel like making a triple threat match and having Paige win the title back would have made more sense because, of, to my recollection, that's what ends up happening is she wins the title back. AJ ends up retiring shortly after this, I think. And then Paige wins the title back, I think. I think, right? I, I, I swear she wins it again. It was after this we had the thing, but no. No, it's Charlotte. It's Charlotte that wins the title from Nikki Bella. So no, Paige never gets it back. It's Charlotte. It's Nikki held it to Night of Champions in 2015. And that's when Charlotte wins. And she holds it till next WrestleMania. And we'll talk about that bullshit when we get to that. But anyway, yeah. I feel like it should have been a triple threat match. Paige should have won. Because Charlotte beating Paige at Night of Champions also would have worked. Because I feel like in that whole New Year's Revolution, Paige arguably started it. By showing up the night after WrestleMania, got the shaft, and the only people, only ones that the people talk about from there are Sasha, Becky, and Charlotte, and Paige was one of the ones that started it. I'm just saying. So next, we have the United States. No, no, we have introduced in the Hall of Fame, which I also skipped. Now we have the United States Championship: Rusev versus John Cena, and I was laughing because. I guess the audience hated both of these guys so much that they were just cheering, let's go, Lana. Let's go, Lana. I was like... <laughs> so what happened here is that John Cena, yeah, I think he faced at Fastlane and he lost. And he won another match. And Rusev said no. And so he beat the hell out of Rusev till Lana said yes. And Rusev got mad at Lana for showing any compassion. And she even says... I will not show any confession ever again. I'm like, that is fucking stupid. But this match, uh, John Cena comes out, and then Rusev comes out on a tank. Uh, Rusev comes out first. He's on a tank, and then John Cena comes out. And, uh, yeah, we have a match that felt like a bit of a slog. And I don't know. I just felt like... I think this was about... 13 to 15 minutes long, and it should have been shorter to about 10 minutes. Because it, it just felt like there was so much going on in this match that, or, no. It felt like it was, this match was going so long, and nothing was really happening. In, in my opinion, it just, I don't know. But, John Cena won. 
Because of course he did. Even though you can argue that Rusev should have won. But the way the story was going, yeah, of course it was John Cena. We were celebrating and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, we're going to move on to another segment that I sort of fast forward through. Because Triple H is definitely come out to announce the attendance. And then use that to basically say, oh, I'm Triple H. Uh, I beat Sting. Uh, and yeah, I beat all of you. Uh, and uh, I'm the best. Uh, and then The Rock comes out. And uh, and they have a war of words. And then Stephanie gets in his face. Triple, Triple H gets in his face. And then Stephanie gets in his face. And then he walks out, goes to ringside, gets Ronda Rousey. They walk all the way around the whole damn ring. To come into the ring. It's what it feels like. He goes, he just walks off to the side and they walk all the way around to the steps to get in. Only for Rhonda to then they have more talking. I'm like, really? We're talking? And then Rhonda. See, this is about these WrestleMania's around this time. It's a day thing. We have not only great matches, but moments. We have to put nonsensical segments like this in there. And if you want to think about nonsensical segments, we'll talk about this one. But most nonsensical of all is WrestleMania 35. That show was very long. Very, very long. So long that on the DVD it fills three discs. Yeah, that's how long it was. It's like six hours or so. It was very long. And on top of that, when it was time for the main event, they decided, nah, let's not go straight to the main event. Instead, we're going to have uh, R-Truth and Carmella come out to do a dance break. Usually it's supposed to be seven seconds, but it lasted like a minute. A long minute. But anyway, yeah, this was supposed to set up something the next year, I think, and then nothing happened. It ended up going to like WrestleMania 34, but The Rock wasn't available, so they used Kurt Angle. Yeah, it ended up going to WrestleMania 34, and it was Kurt Angle instead of The Rock, because The Rock... Yeah, The Rock's WrestleMania moment at WrestleMania 32 we'll talk about next year. Cause it, uh... Anyway, it is Undertaker versus the self-proclaimed new face of fear, which they keep mentioning throughout this match, which is another thing that leads me to think, Bray Wyatt should have won this. Look, The Undertaker had an undefeated streak. I already told you it was hindered by the fact that he beat multiple, the same people multiple times. But he lost his streak, right? This was the return of The Undertaker. Sure, fine, whatever. But he lost the streak. He was no longer undefeated. So I think losing to Bray Wyatt, the pe person they were saying was the next face of fear, the new face of fear, the, the next Undertaker kind of character. Bray Wyatt winning this would have made sense. But no, this wasn't about that. This was about the return of The Undertaker and The Undertaker winning this match. Which I feel like this is the this is the other one that I did not agree on the winner. Bray Wyatt should have won this match, especially since... Now, I know you sit there and you say, well, well, Undertaker can't lose two years in a row. Bray Wyatt lost two years in a row. So... Your argument does not stand. Goodbye. But yeah, this was fine. Again, I feel like it went a little too long, especially for The Undertaker at this point. He was kind of hobbling around towards the end of the match there. I'm, I'm just saying, you know. And you say, well, what about if you had the match with Sting? Uh, Sting was continuing to wrestle till about a month ago, and I think Sting would have been able to carry the match. Unlike Goldberg, who couldn't carry a regular match in 1997. Anyway, yeah, this was fine. Wrong person won, but it was fine. And, uh, yeah, time for the main event of the evenings. And it's WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Barack Lesnar defending the title against Roman Reigns. Boo. 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 And everyone's booing. Here's the situation. So, we got to go all the way back to the Royal Rumble in 2014. In that Royal Rumble, the final two were Roman Reigns and Batista. Uh, if you remember correctly, everyone wanted Daniel Bryan to win that, even though it was kind of far-fetched to think it was going to be Daniel Bryan. 
Well, when number 30 came out, it was Rey Mysterio. Rey Mysterio got booed out of the building. It, it, poor Rey Mysterio. But it became obvious that Batista was winning. So the whole match got booed. Until the last two, Roman Reigns got overly cheered because nobody wanted uh, Batista to win. Batista won anyway. And then we got the triple threat match. So Vince Man obviously saw this and went, oh, uh, they were really cheering him. Uh, so he is going to win next year then. But Vin without Vince Man realizing they weren't cheering Roman because they liked him. They were cheering him because they hated Batista. So flash forward one year, Royal Rumble 2015, Roman wins massive boos because no one wanted him to win. But everyone knew he was going to. And so now Vince McMahon has shot himself in the foot once again with the WrestleMania main event. So what are you going to do? What are you gonna do? The obvious choice is to have Brock Lesnar retain, but nobody wanted Brock Lesnar to be champion either because he was he's a part-time champion. And I know that in 2024, talking about a champion that is never there is kind of moot because Roman Reigns has had that title hostage since 2020. So, I, I don't know. We're almost four years now. Uh, but, yeah. So we got Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns. Right? The whole point is basically saying Roman can't beat Brock. He's not going to main event level. Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> Am I Thor? But, uh... Um... Yeah, it was just... Yeah, so we get the standard Brock Lesnar match, basically. Suplex, suplex. Roman reverses. Superman punch, spears. Kickouts, 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 kickouts. The point that the announcers are going, Oh, what is it going to take for Roman Reigns to beat Brock Lesnar? What is it going to take for Brock Lesnar to put away Roman Reigns? Blah, 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 blah. And so, at one point... uh. Roman goes for the spear, but doesn't go for the pin. He's going to go for another one. Brock catches him, hits the F5, doesn't go for the pin. He can't move. And then you hear... <laughs> Seth Rollins comes running down the ridiculously long ramps they have at these shows. I don't know to do that. I'd stop halfway through. <laughs> With the briefcase, cashes in. This is one of the few times where the cash-in person doesn't look stupid by bringing a referee with them. Because a lot of the times, when they go to cash-in on someone who's in the ring, they'll bring a referee with, and there's a referee already right there. But when they, he doesn't bring a referee with him. He comes running out with the briefcase, dented because then he hit someone in the head with it or something. I mean, he's, he's stomp. He go, it's officially cash-in. It's now a triple threat match, which technically, if he's cashing in on the champion... And the current match should be canceled, and it's only him versus Brock. I'm just saying, if he's cashing in the money in the bank, he's doing it for a championship match, his championship match, which means that the match currently in progress should be canceled out, and it should be him versus Brock. But then Roman interfering would be illegal and because of disqualification, so we make a triple threat match, it makes sense. You could just have Roman lay down the whole time, but no. So he hits the stomp on Brock. So he kicks uh, Roman out, hits the stomp on Brock, stomp on Brock, goes to hit another one. Lesnar goes up for the up five. Roman goes back into the ring, spears Lesnar. Lesnar rolls out. Rollins get back, gets back up, hits the stomp on Roman, wins one, two, three. And he's celebrating. He's got the whole thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a shirt. I'm gonna use a shirt. So I wanna go and grab the belts. He's celebrating. Put the belt like this. He's celebrating. He's all happy. And the show goes out the air with him holding the championship, which is probably the best decision they could make in this situation. Because you know, you gotta think about it. Like. They, 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 they say that Brock signed a new contract, but again, he's only going to be part-time. I mean, it's going to be there. 
And obviously Roman was supposed to win, but Vince had to change it because nobody wanted him to. Which is going to influence WrestleMania 32 in more ways than one. But uh, yeah. And I, for one, was shocked because, uh, admittedly, I thought Rollins was going to be another one of those that were going to fail in cashing in. I He won a briefcase, and I went, no, that's a bad choice. There's no way he's going to be world champion. He's high mid-card at, at best. Intercontinental U.S., sure. World champion, never. So I thought he was going to fail, and they did this, and I went, oh, okay, they throw him in. So that Brock can pin him and Roman can stay. No, I wasn't pinned. No, he won and he pinned Roman, which I'm, I remembered wrong. Mandela effect. I thought he pinned Brock. I was like, okay. I remember him coming in and hitting the, the, the stomp on Brock. And I thought he pinned him with it. Now, I played the video game, but I didn't guess I didn't remember it right. I played through the, the match on the video game, you know. Because I had to get the arenas. Because, oh, we'll give you the pack. The WrestleMania 40. The, the 40 WrestleMania unlockable thing. But you're only going to unlock the superstars. Why do they have to have an asterisk on these things? The supercharger only does the legends. And the and the arenas and everything you can get with the VC. Why do you have to play through to get the arenas? If you're going to if you're gonna be, make it able to unlock the superstars, the arena should go with it. I, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, I admittedly never thought Rollins was going to be anything that I made Carter, and I was proved wrong. Although I thought, perhaps, oh, that's WrestleMania. At the next pay-per-view, Roman's going to win it. No, surprisingly, he held it until, I think he held it too long. And, like, I, I wish no will no, 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 no against anyone, but that injury to his knee or whatever it was, was a godsend because... Who knows what that was going to be going to WrestleMania? Now, what we got at WrestleMania 32 was not good, but I think Roman was going to be crowned champion anyway. I don't know, but I don't know. But it's a very good WrestleMania. Very good. The stage, the, the set, the stage, it looks, it is one of the best WrestleMania stages I've seen. It is great. They come running out. I used it on the game. And it looks better on 2K24 than it did in 2K16, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, this is one of the best WrestleManias ever, which is why next time... So, you're watching this on a Saturday, if you're watching the day it came out, and I am going to hold myself to this on Wednesday. Sometime on Wednesday, April 3rd. You'll witness one of the worst WrestleManias of all time. When we talk about the lows of WrestleMania 32. Until then, thank you for watching. I've been Scotty. My nose itches. And I'll see you in the next one. See what happens when you try to be professional and your nose is like, no, I'm itchy and you make it look stupid.